So um, I just graduated from the University of Virginia and joined the author's program. I'm, uh, yeah, coming to you live from Arlington, Virginia. And I'm now basically a full-time researcher at the University of Virginia uh, in the machine learning lab. We're studying this idea of like adversarial attacks or adversarial examples in natural language and what those like even are. And so through our research, we've created this library called text attack, which sort of started as like a shared implementation of the adversarial attacks from a bunch of different NLP papers. And it's grown to be this like framework or way of thinking about adversarial attacks and their construction. So I have a presentation. I'm just about to share my screen. Um, and I'm really excited about this because we actually had an open source text attack until like a couple weeks ago. So you guys are going to be some of the first people to actually see it. Lavanya, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, awesome. We're set. So uh, the title of this presentation is Text Attack, a Python framework for NLP attacks. And it's available on GitHub under uh, QData slash text attack. Actually, I'll show that really quickly. Um, yeah, this is our GitHub repository if you want to check it out later and like download it, install it. You can run pip install text attack, run some NLP attacks for yourself. I wanted to give this disclaimer before I forget. Um, to run an attack, you're going to need at least a model and probably some data. So if you're running it on your laptop, just be warned that, that you know, models like state-of-the-art NLP models can take up a few gigabytes. And just like, you know, TensorFlow Hub or any other library that comes with its own models, it's going to download them and just save them to your hard drive. So yeah, just a fair word of warning. So I'm going to do a couple introduction slides about text attack, talk about adversarial examples in NLP, then go through like a sample use case of an NLP attack implemented in text attack. And then at the end, I'll do a demo and talk about like a use case that might be more useful for you all, which is using text attack for data augmentation. So, so some things you can do with text attack are build and run NLP attacks, but instead of um, providing just a, basically like the implementations of a bunch of attacks, we've come up with this framework of four components that you can use to construct an NLP attack. So you can mix and match those components to customize your own attacks or recreate some from the literature. Um, and once you've created an attack, you can run it via the command line or the Python interface and run it on a custom model or a data set and visualize it using wisdom or just printing things to the command line, saving things to CSV if you want to do data analysis or maybe reuse for adversarial training or whatever. Um, and also now, as of last week, we support weights and biases, which is biases, which is really cool. So you can run an attack and then automatically send the data off to your weights and biases account. And then you'll have like a link you can send around or just a web page you can go and see the results of the attack and actually look at the attack results. Um, or if, if you're not interested in running atta attacks, you can use text attack or the components of text attack to develop your own attacks, benchmark the attacks from the literature or compare them in a shared framework, which is one of like the main motivations we had for developing it. Or you can just take some components of text attack for whatever you need. So I think one of the most popular uses for text attack is uh, the procedure for running an attack on an NLP model is pretty similar to just generating extra training data using data augmentation. So you can just use some components of text attack and we have some built-in features for that that I'll talk about at the end. So text attack is for everyone, but I wrote down three different like popular use cases for text attack. So anyone who's doing research on robustness or adversarial examples in natural language can use text attack to implement attacks or compare them if you're just a machine learning practitioner who's interested in these ideas, you can download text attack and run it, look in the data. I'm, we're, very, uh, we're very big proponents of you know, getting into the data and actually looking at examples, like scrolling through tens or hundreds of adversarial examples produced to understand your model's output and especially the attack procedure. Um, and the third use case I wrote down was anyone who's training an NLP model, even if you're not interested in maybe your model's robustness or exploring what your model's blind, blind spots are, you might just be looking for some way to increase your test set accuracy. And depending on the task, data augmentation can generally 
Um, they give you like a one or two percent test set inquiries just for free on whatever task you're training on. So even if you're not interested in like security or robustness, data augmentation with text attack is really easy. Um, so I'm going to talk about adversarial examples and thankfully my previous presenter did some of the work for me so I can just skip some of my stuff. Um, and what the idea of adversarial examples are in NLP, then how that ties into our um, framework, like the four components that to make up an NLP attack as in text attack. Then I'm going to do a short demo, just like run some stuff on the command line. And then I'll talk about data augmentation and take some questions. So uh, a little bit of terminology before we get started. Uh, we're going to refer to changes that fool the model as adversarial examples or adversarial perturbations. Personally, I prefer the terminology adversarial perturbation because that implies that there's some sort of starting point that's been perturbed. And I think it's a little more clear than adversarial examples, which sometimes are things that the, the adversary creates from scratch, which is not something that like text attack does. We're talking about adversarial perturbations. Then the program that creates adversarial examples is known as the adversarial attack. And the model's resistance for adversarial examples or like basically the model's level of security in this context is called the robustness. So a model that's more susceptible to adversarial examples is less robust. And so that's some really common terminology, whether you're talking about NLP models or vision models. We actually just talked about this. This is a picture of a pig that when a small amount of noise is added, it's grossly misclassified by some ImageNet classifier. Um, and this is like the idea of an adversarial example, which made a big splash when the first paper was published by Ian Goodfellow in 2014. And a lot of people have been pursuing this line of research since then. But it's still sort of an open question, what are adversarial examples in NLP? Because like, if you look at this picture, this pig on the left and the pig on the right, these are indistinguishable images. Like the, this perturbation 0 0.005 is so small that it, it's literally too small for the human eye to distinguish. There's no, there's no analogous example in text. You can't produce a sequence of text on the left and a sequence of text on the right that two humans can't tell apart, or one human can't tell apart, unless, unless those sequences of text are the same. So one idea researchers have proposed are adversarial examples in text are two sequences that are almost visually indistinguishable. So maybe they differ by a few words or characters, and someone who's reading really quickly can't tell the difference. So let's look at an example. This is an input. It's a movie review. Uh, inputted to a sentiment classifier. It says, True Grip was the best movie I've seen since I was a small boy. Under this definition of an adversarial example, anything that makes a small character change or maybe a few character changes is considered an imperceptible change. And one that introduces a misclassification is called an adversarial example. So on the right here, we see the string has been edited a slight bit. Actually, no characters have been added or removed. They've just been moved around. So it's pretty easy uh, to parse. But the, the classification is negative. So if you're training a model and you see this example, that's pretty interesting. But you can also probably defend your system from this type of attack. Like one way to do it would be just install a spell checker. And before passing any input to your model, whether it's like a sentiment classifier or a translation model, you make sure it, it passes a simple grammar check. Um, some other work has come out that did a more complicated thing where they trained like a recurrent neural network to take the input on the right and then correct it. So like it would take this input and then produce hopefully the input on the left, basically just a spelling corrector and a correct for character deletions and insertions. And that was proposed as a, another defense against this sort of attack. And actually they work really well. Um, and I'm going to talk about one other idea of adversarial examples in NLP, which is uh, probably more more relevant to the recent literature and like we we implement more of these approaches in text attack. So this idea is that adversarial examples in NLP are sequences that are indistinguishable in meaning to the original input. So if we look at this same uh, input from the previous slide, the movie review about True Grit, we could imagine some different paraphrases that contain all the same meaning but change the output of the classifier. So this is an example that I made up, but 
could well be true where we substituted the word small and boy for we lad. So the whole sentence, true grit was the best movie I've seen since I was a wee lad was, was um, predicted a, a, negative, a negative sentiment by the model. I'm not exactly sure um, why that would be, maybe because the model hasn't seen enough examples of these words or this phrasage, or for some reason it thinks these two words have a negative connotation. But in any event, if you trained a sentiment classifier and you saw this, this is a bug. You would use this as an example for retraining or just some, some data for understanding how your model misclassifies some test points. So th this is um, actually not like a full sentence paraphrase. This is just by swapping out small for we, which is a direct synonym substitution, and boy for lad, which is also a direct synonym substitution. It turns out that doing actual paraphrases with machine learning models is really hard and no one's done it yet. Or, or done it well enough to be applied in this adversarial example context where the model can pick up on any small change to the original input. I think the closest thing I ever heard of that was actual neural paraphrase was this paper that Google came out with. It's called Ask the Right Questions, um, question, question reformulation using reinforcement learning or something like that, where they trained one model to paraphrase inputs for another model to try and optimize uh, to try and like basically it took a question and rephrased the question so that another model would have the best chance of answering the question correctly but anyways paraphrase is hard and most uh nlp attacks focus on this idea of a synonym substitution like here taking small and replacing it with we so there's some different ways to do this i think the most obvious would be use a thesaurus you know like a, take something that lists the synonyms for words, look up the word, and then try replacing all the synonyms and see how that affects the classification score. Uh, this, this would work, but I, as it turns out, it's just not going to be enough. I think that no matter how much time you spend on it, your thesaurus isn't going to have that many entries, and it's not going to be able to keep a current list of all the synonyms for all the usages of every word. So a, a more feasible approach is by using word embeddings. If you take the embeddings of words that are trained by a model and look at their nearest neighbors, you're going to get a pretty good idea of what their synonyms are. Like, for example, small might have neighbors like little and tiny. Um, but th this introduces a problem because another neighbor to small in the embedding space might be big because they're used in very similar contexts, even though they have different meanings when used. So people dealt with this problem by creating a new type of embedding. They take the original embeddings and apply this post-processing step called counterfeiting, where they take the, the thesaurus words and try to make synonyms really close together and antonyms far apart. So there's actually one set of counterfeited word vectors from this paper, 2016 paper, that is used in a lot of, a lot of different applications, including some of the most prominent uh, NLP attacks in the literature. So counterfeited vectors are something that we use often in text attack for doing word replacements. This step by going from the sentence about the small boy to the sentence about the wee lad is in within the text attack context a transformation which is one of our four components. A transformation takes an input and produces a list of potential adversarial examples. Um, but this, this brings us to the next question, like what happens when it messes up? Uh, I put two examples of maybe questionable adversarial perturbations on the right. One says True Grit, True Grit was the worst film I've seen since I was a small boy. And one says True Grit was the best movie I've seen since me were a small boy. These are both reasonable transformations that could be proposed by the, the thesaurus or the embedding or the counterfeited embedding word or synonym swap method. Um, so they could all be like feasibly produced by what we just suggested. The first one's a problem because, I mean, it changes the sentiment. This is actually correctly classified. If it says True Grit was the worst film I've seen since I was a boy, that's actually, that's a very negative review and the model's producing it or predicting it correctly. The second one is maybe still a positive review. Yeah, it's probably a positive review, but maybe you don't care how your model behaves on this because this is just grammatically incorrect. Either way, it's definitely in more of a uh, in the space of inputs. And so the first one violates 
the semantics of the original input, and the second one violates the grammaticality. Um, in, in either case, we're going to want to like filter out things like this during our NLP attack. So when our embedding suggests replacing best with worst, we want to have some kind of catch that'll prevent us from making that replacement. Same with making these grammatical mistakes in the second example. So here's two ideas that could have prevented those two cases from the last slide. One, we could have produced sentence embeddings from the input on the left and the input on the right, or x and x add, and compare their sentence embeddings. So the idea is that the first input and the second input would have a low correlation or a small cosine similarity between their sentence embeddings because they mean very different things. And then the second idea proposed here is just use a grammar checker. This sentence is grammatically correct. This sentence is not. It shouldn't be allowed in our NLP attack. So these are very common uh, to have this kind of like catch or um, like to have to have some function that you make sure that you ensure your adversarial example meets as part of your attack. And we see this all the time in the NLP attack literature, whether it's using the sentence encoder or a language model to make sure that the, that the adversarial example actually makes sense. So this is the second component of the text attack framework, which we call constraints. So once you produce your set of transformations, you check all the constraints to make sure that the transformations are valid. So hopefully that'll filter out the uh, bad examples that we've shown on this slide. Next slide. Um, so these are the last two pieces of the text attack framework. Once you've taken your set of transformations and filtered it by the constraints, you still need a way to actually search the transformations and apply them over and over again until you find a valid adversarial example. So this is what we call the search method in text attack. Um, there are different search methods that are common. You could just use some like greedy method that tries the most promising word to swap over and over again. That would be like a fast way to do it or you could use something slower like theme search. And the last component we need is actually a way to know whether our example is successful. So once we apply the search or iteratively search and get a list of transformations, how do we know when to stop? Um, a common case, like the case we said before, is when the, when the class is changed. So the, the positive review was perturbed to a negative review. The original class was positive. Once that class changed, we stop. That's generally called like untargeted classification. Another common one is trying to induce a particular class, which would be targeted classification. Uh, and in any event, this is the fourth component. And so this is called the goal function in text attack. And these are all pretty similarly named in the code. So before we had text attack dot transformations, text attack dot constraints, this is search methods and goal functions. And the idea is that we implement a lot of search methods, a lot of goal functions, a lot of transformations, and a lot of constraints. Along the way, we recreate as many attacks as possible, and then we can mix and match these components to try and learn things about them and learn things about our models. So now I'm going to explain the framework a little more formally. Um, these are the four pieces I talked about before. The text attack framework says that NLP attacks are constructed from four components. Transformation, which is like the synonym substitutions that we mentioned before generates a list of potential perturbations, constraints that filter out perturbations that we don't want, the goal function, which tells us when we can stop, and the search method that if the goal function isn't fulfilled, takes the list of potential perturbations and applies the transformation again to the most promising ones. So now we're going to look at like a, an attack from the literature and how we would implement it within text attack, and then we'll do the demo. Um, oh yeah, and, and I mentioned before, these are, these are just the classes in text attack. So goal functions actually extend the goal function class. Same with constraints and transformations. We're trying to make the API as straightforward as possible so that we can uh, continue to think within this framework. So this is, a, a, this is a graph of like, or a chart of all the things within the text attack ecosystem. You can see the four components here, transformations, constraints, search methods and goal functions, which vary by task. Um, and we don't have to go through everything here, but we support things like synonym substitutions, swapping characters, like in the first definition of adversarial examples, and then all sorts of constraints, like constraining just based on edit distance or based on the sentence encoder similarity, based on language model predictions or the grammatical errors from a free grammar checker, different search methods and, and goal functions. So the idea is that this will keep growing and along the way, we'll be able to construct examples from the literature from these components. 
So uh, here's an example paper. Uh, this paper is called, Is BERT Really Robust? And it was published about a year ago. It's, it proposes a greedy algorithm called text fooler for attacking NLP models. And uh, they, they release their code and they, they uh, I think somewhere they show that they have a 97% success rate attacking BERT within their constraints. So on page two, they have this, which is the pseudocode for text fooler. What we did is uh, go through the pseudocode and the actual code and try and distill out the, co the four components of text attack, the transformation, constraints, goal function, and search method. So I, I already did it for you. If we look at the uh, pseudocode, we're gonna be able to spot everything. So they, they suggest a, a greedy search method which with word importance ranking, which is something like what I said before, is they come up with an order to find the most salient or important words to the model and substitute those in order to try and save time and minimize the number of words swapped. They swap words with their neighbors in the counterfeited embedding space. They have three constraints, one on the cosine similarity between the swap words, one to ensure the part of speech is the same, one to ensure small sentence embedding or a large sentence embedding cosine similarity, and they go until the yk, the result, the prediction of the candidate is different than the prediction of the original input. So this is basically like going until the class score is changed. This is what we'd call untargeted classification. And if you go back to the chart from before, we've implemented all these things, all three constraints, the transformation, the search method, and the goal function. So if we just take those components, the transformation, the three constraints, the search method, and the goal function, we can just recreate this attack in text attack with a few lines of code. So we actually have a, a part of our package, like a module called textattack.attackrecipes, which includes code like this, which is a re-implementation of the attack based on those four components. And this shows like how, how little code it takes. So this is word swap in the counterfeited embedding space. These are the three constraints, word embedding distance, part of speech, and universal sentence encoder. Here's the goal function, which is untargeted classification. And lastly, the search method, the attack base is just greedy word swap with word importance ranking. So this is the actual syntax for creating the, the attack within text attack. This is the code in GitHub. Um, and now I'm gonna do a quick demo of actually running that recipe. So I realized um, I shared a screen that's not my terminal. Okay, now I'm sharing my terminal. Uh, Okay, cool. So I've already installed text attack via pip install text attack. So to run it, I uh, call the Python module python m, type text attack, and then I'm going to type dash dash help here. I have it installed like the edit editable version, which means that it takes a few seconds to load and everything. But by typing dash dash help, what I want to do is see a list of all the arguments for calling text attack from the command line. The idea is that like, it'll tell me the possible recipes I can use, the attack recipes, the transformations, goal functions, and constraints. So I'm not gonna go through everything here. This is pretty much like the same as the visualization I showed before, but here's all the transformations. Down here, we have the goal functions. Um, and also, instead of choosing the transformation constraint goal function, I could just uh, apply an attack recipe, which is what I'm going to do now. So Python dash m text attack. The recipe, our name for it is just text fooler, which is like what they called it in the paper. Um, and then I'm going to attack one of the pre-trained models. So I'm going to use BERT dash MR. That's BERT fine tuned for that MR data set, which is just a small uh, sentiment classification data set. And it's just fast and easy. Um, and then maybe let's do 20 examples. This text fooler is really fast, so that should be okay. Um, what else do we want to do? Let's enable CSV so I can see my results in CSV later. And most importantly, enable weights and biases. So again, takes a second to load. Um, and also to initialize the attack, as you might imagine. I mean, BERT itself is a few gigabytes, so it loads BERT onto the GPU. One of the constraints is the universal sentence encoder, which is also very large, and it has to load that onto the GPU. Um, it has to get the word embeddings, which are 
a few gigabytes and um, luckily the nearest neighbors are pre-computed so it's not like it has to do some kind of nearest neighbor algorithm nearest neighbor like algorithm but it still takes a few seconds to set up so um, I guess we'll wait a second for this to initialize the text attack has this cache folder that it saves everything to this is this is output is from tensorflow hub so they use dot cache slash tensorflow hub um, well, I'm here it's calling tensorflow hub because tensorflow pro provides us the universal sentence encoder but text attacks own models are saved to dot cache slash text attack by default and you can override that but it automatically downloads everything on the first time you use it. So we host our models on Amazon S3 and we just query them using like a wget basically. And there we go. Um, wait for, and then you have to wait for it to download on the first time you use it, that's all. Um, so at the beginning it prints out the attack. This, this is the sin, same syntax as like if you print out a module in PyTorch. So you, again, you can see the four components. The attack is the search method, so this is, greedy word swap with word importance ranking, untargeted classification, the transformation is counterfeited embeddings, that's what this means. Uh, there's three constraints here, and it's a black box attack. So yeah, this is basically gonna do the same thing as the pseudocode that's described in that paper. And this is gonna run 20 times, and it's gonna log to this weights and biases uh, dashboard. I'm gonna copy that so we can look at it at the end. Oh, wow, that was fast. You know, okay, well, yeah, so this is the attack results. The attack was uh, originally 80% accurate, so it predicted, uh, I guess, 16 out of 20 correctly. And then afterwards, it was only 5% accurate. So that means the attack must have succeeded 15 out of the 16 times. Oh, yeah, so 93.75% successful. And on average, it perturbed 21.12 words. So let's look at an example here. Um, MR is lowercase by default, which is annoying to me. Um, here, the jokes are flat and the action looks fake. That's a negative, uh, negative review, though not that negative. Then the perturbation is the jokes are flat and the strides look forged. That's a pretty good one. Um, you'll see the universal sentence encoder similarity and the word embedding constraint are actually relatively lenient. So if you didn't notice already, a decent amount of these are uh, pretty lax, I'd say. I'm going to go back to Chrome and we can look at the weights and biases run. Oh no, I copied the percentage. Here we go. So since I added that flag dash dash enable W and B, it automatically printed to weights and biases. Um, so this is the same table we saw before of the statistics from the attack. And then here it's um, all the results visualized in HTML. So let's look at one more. This didn't get changed. So this means this is like a, fa a failed attack result. So I guess substituting, this is a stop word. So it probably tried substituting each of these and failed. Oisterous and daft documentary changed to rambunctious and daft documentary. That one's questionably supposed to be negative as well. But yeah, so you could run the attack with more than 20 examples and probably spend all day looking at these trying to understand your model's output and we also if you add a dash dash parallel which i should have and forgot it'll distribute across all the gpus on your machine whoops this is the wrong tab so you can get a pretty big speed up okay so that was the demo and lastly i'm going to talk about data augmentation i think this is probably the most uh most important use case to the general public so if you're training an NLP model, try, like seriously, try to send me an email, change a few lines in your training script. And instead of using your regular training set, especially if it's small, so a few thousand or maybe you know, probably fewer than 20,000 examples, it would be most effective. Augment your training set with a few times the size using text attack and, and see how your performance increases. So here's, embedding augmenting in a few lines. We have a few recipes for augmentation. This one replaces words with their counterfeited nearest neighbors. The sentence is what I cannot create, I do not understand, a Richard Feynman quote. And by default, this embedding augmenter is just gonna return all of the potential augmentations. So since I didn't add any parameters, it's just gonna swap out one word and return all the things that 
it could possibly do. So these are pretty good. What I cannot create, I do not fathom. What I cannot create, I do not realize. What I cannot create, I do not understood. That's not good grammar, but I didn't add the, uh, the grammar checking constraints, so that makes sense. Anyways, you could append these to your training set along with the correct ID for the correct output for S and train on a larger training set and see what your results are. So I actually did that earlier today. The data set I just tested on is the MR data set, which by default has 9,595 training examples, which is pretty, I'd say it's on the small side for an NLP task. And also BERT is surprisingly bad at it for how easy you would think it is. It's, I think, oh, well, this shows it. So originally it's 86.4% accurate, um, which is kind of surprising. Just you would think it would be easier. That's probably due to just the, the short length of the sentences. There's just not enough information, maybe a little bit of noise. Some of them are misclassified. I don't know. But so I, I instantiated an embedding augmenter just like this. And for each training example, I added eight augmented examples. So I guess, uh, oh no, sorry. This is, uh, yeah, yeah. So this is four, 14 times, not, not nine. Um, anyways, here's a bar chart produced by weights and biases of the sizes, the relative sizes of the data sets. And you can see the augmented one performs, outperforms the vanilla one by about 1%. Um, I bet if I ran this over more hyperparameters, tried different amounts of things to change and tried swapping out different words, maybe tried the thesaurus and said, I could push this up a little more. But it was about, I don't know, eight lines of code that I wrote and it increased my performance by 1%. So that's a pretty good bargain. Oh, that was supposed to go before. And then the uh, last slide is, this is a screenshot of actually the, the paper we wrote about text attack. So the, if, you, if you're interested in the more theoretical details of how we define NLP attacks, or maybe you want to see how some other attacks from the literature can get implemented in text attack, or some more things about what goes on behind the scenes in text attack, you should definitely check out the paper. I was hoping it, we released it to archive a few weeks ago. I was hoping it would be published today, but there's been a big delay. Apparently it's coming out in the morning, so we can't look at it tonight. But if you go on archive in the morning and type in text attack, you should be able to find this paper. Um, and if you're not interested in the paper, that's okay. You can install it, just pip install text attack or go to this GitHub repository and clone it, fork it. Um, you can always contact me. Let me know what you think. If you have suggestions or find a bug, could happen. Yeah, so now I'm ready for questions. Cool, that was really good, Jack. Uh, thank you. So I have a question first. Uh, what models and data sets does text attack provide? Huh. Good, good question. Um, so we're working on adding more tasks, but I think I should talk about the tasks first. Um, so what I just showed was sentiment classification. So we support some sentiment classification models and other classification tasks. Like I, I thought this was in the README, but yeah, so AG news topic classification. Then we have three different entailment data sets, uh, SNLI, MNLI matched and unmatched. And then we have one translation data set, which is English to German. We, we have pre-trained models for all of these, um, for a few different model types. So like for each of these classification types, you can just, instead of typing BERT-MR, you could type LSTM-MR and attack an LSTM, or uh, I'd have to look at the help to make sure, but there's a, a convolutional neural network and LSTM and BERT train for all of these things, plus uh, Google T5, which is actually provided by Hugging Face. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so Sayek so also asked, what frameworks do you guys support? Yeah, I, um, I should have mentioned that. That's a really good question, Sayak. So most of the code is PyTorch. So like when we're doing operations with tensors um, or matrix multiplication, stuff like that happens in PyTorch. But it generally doesn't matter. Like text attack is just going to call your model for prediction score. So it works on TensorFlow models, PyTorch, JAX, whatever, sklearn. Um, but there are some things like, for example, this attack recipe, which is called seek to sick. Where is it? 
they swap words by looking at the gradient and taking the words that have the maximum gradient like of the one hot encoding at different steps. So the gradient stuff is implemented in PyTorch, so it has to be a PyTorch model. But it, yeah, it doesn't matter. And we, we also require TensorFlow. So some things are TensorFlow, like the universal sentence encoder that I mentioned before. Uh, Boris asked, would it be easy to use with hugging face? And I feel like you kind of answered that, but. Yeah, uh, it, de it definitely would. I mean, the, the thing that I showed, the graph is models that I trained um, using hugging face. Like I just use the BERT, um, what's it called? Like the BERT for fine tuning class. And then I just provided my own data set. I didn't use their script. I wrote my own training script, but yeah, you could definitely use it with hugging face. Just increase the data set size. All, all of the behind the scenes stuff, like the pre-trained models and the tokenization and things, they all use hugging face transformers and tokenizers. All right, uh, Joseph asks, uh, does this work well for all languages? Good question, Joseph. Unfortunately, n no. Um, right now, we're just supporting the perturbation stuff is in English, just because it's, it's, it's hard to get like a good set of synonyms in another language and actually um, like get good results is pretty difficult. But hopefully in the future, we're gonna have like embeddings and synonyms at least for multiple languages. Right now we just support English as the starting language and then like you can run it on translation models that translate from English to another language. Uh, Sayak has all the best questions right now. He also asked, uh, what effect does it have on class labels associated with uh, the text pieces? Is there a hyperparameter uh, that you can tweak that would let users control the amount of augmentation? Applied? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. So that's something that um, a lot of papers disagree about, like to where to set those knobs. Like, for example, I said before, um, we require a cosine similarity between words of 0 0.8 for the embedding augmenter, you can change that. And you can change the number of words to swap or the number of examples you'd like to include in your augmented data set. So those are all like hyperparameters that you can adjust yourself. Nice. Uh, how would you formulate validation metrics for measuring the performance of the models that are adversarially robust in this case. Uh, Sayek says he understands the context of adversarial robustness might change from domain to domain. Yeah, um, absolutely. So the first thing you have to do is define your threat model. And if you know what kinds of threats that you're trying to defend against, you can create an attack that tests for, the, or that uh, creates those kinds of adversaries. So basically you settle on the attack that you want to defend against and then you can measure robustness by the attack success rate. So in the example I showed, the attack was successful 93.75% of the time, which is like relatively high. So if you trained a model that was more robust against this type of synonym substitution, then hopefully the attack would be less than 93% successful. Um, but I guess like to answer your question succinctly, like attack success rate is the main metric. Uh, I wanted to follow uh, that question up, actually. Uh, so first, I wanted to say that I really like this work, Jack. Uh, I've done some research you. on adversarial perturbations for images, and it was massively helped by Foolbox, the, which is, I think, primarily targeted images. I don't know all the features, but it's great to see that people are doing that in NLP. But uh, something, like, one thing that image folks really benefit from is that there are objective metrics like L infinity distance, which is the maximum change, L2 distance, which is sort of, you know, the mean squared error of the perturbation. And so this has allowed people to come up with things like Lipschitz constrained networks that can be provably adversarially robust. So I'm curious, like, to what extent do you think that's even possible in NLP? What have people done to try and get that level of adversarial protection in NLP, where you wouldn't need to know a threat model because you actually have the right notion of what it means to attack objectively. Yeah, that's that's a super good question. So I, I think like I didn't really talk about this in the presentation because it was more about like the framework, I guess, than a research background. But that's like the the main research question in this line of work and like adversarial examples in NLP is 
like what is the equivalent of the L infinity norm for images, which maybe everyone can agree on for text. And um, unfortunately, I think the problem is that like if, if you think of maybe you're just concerned with semantic perturbations you would, and you would have to come up with some metric of an exact metric of semantics between two text inputs. And that question is like, I guess I would call it like NLP hard. Like if you could exactly quantify the semantic difference between two inputs, you could solve like NLP, any NLP task, you know? So I guess like to measure that kind of L infinity norm, you would need a model or something, which is why people try to use, for example, the universal sentence encoder. And then they get into these disagreements about like, oh, I think, you know, I think 0.9 is the right distance and oh, I think 0.8 is the right distance or whatever. So there's not really a perfect metric. And we created text attack so that hopefully we can kind of like stay ahead of the curve with these types of like constraints. And like whenever someone comes up with maybe like a better way to quantify it, we'll implement it and we can test all the previous attacks within that constraint. Great, that super great answer. Uh, and it also seems like something like the universal sentence encoder is itself subject to mm -hmm. adversarial attacks, mm -hmm. right? And so because you don't have as simple a function for measuring similarity, you end up like, yeah, there's a chicken and egg kind of problem. Yeah, absolutely. Like the, maybe you're not finding a hole in the model, you're just finding some place where the sentence encoder thinks they're really similar even though they're not. Thanks. Also, if you guys haven't met already, I don't think you have, uh, Charles is a deep learning engineer. Um, Re, uh, teacher at Weights and Biases, and Jack is one of our newest authors, so you guys will run into each other soon. Cool. Right, over the Slack. But cool. All right, thank you, Jack. That was really cool. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, thanks for the uh, questions, everybody.